The Unstarving Artist Book is available now at unstarvingartistbook.com. Hey, Preston, how you doing? Great. How are you doing, Harry? Good to see you. It's good to see you as well. Uh, it's been a minute. Um, I think you and I started working together maybe a year ago, year and a half ago, something like that. Almost two years. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it has it been a minute. Flies. Yeah, yeah, so I'm so excited to like connect with you, catch up, kind of hear about some things that have been going on. Um, for those who don't know you, can you just briefly maybe give like a high-level overview of yourself, and then we can kind of dig into your story from there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the short of it is um, I'm a lifelong artist. Um, I'm an abstract artist, um, particularly when it comes to um, you know painting, and I'm also a filmmaker, um, musician as well. But um, yeah, I've uh, I've kind of combined those different skill sets over time, and particularly filmmaking and my um, artwork through some life events to um, do work for myself, but then also uh, help other people, which I'll get into uh, later on. Cool, very cool. So I didn't know you were a musician. So you're a musician, filmmaker, artist. Um, which one of those kind of came to you first when you were coming up? Um, I mean, I, on a very simplistic level, um, it, it's like, you know, I guess using crayons. <laughs> it's, it's, but um, I, I mean, music is something I've done more seriously from an early age. You know, I was in art classes and painting and stuff like that. I think uh, my, my mom put me in, um, you know, more after school art programs than probably, um, you know, most kids just do whatever art in school. But um yeah, been playing music a long time. I didn't really take a lot of it seriously, though, until like junior high. Um, on the music front, it was kind of interesting. My, I uh, had a dad who was like, you're going to play really classical instruments, which I have no idea why he didn't get that guitar is like part of that. Um, just literally a classical guitar, right? <laughs> but so I went through like piano, clarinet, saxophone, you know, didn't really, that wasn't, what I was passionate about, I was really passionate about guitar and that's kind of what kicked it off. Yeah. Or music and the arts, something that was a big part of your parents' lives, your family, like where did that come from? Uh, not my dad. He, he's a very creative person <laughs> by his own admission. Uh, my mom is, um, I just found it, uh, as, as something I naturally gravitated towards, especially, you know, in those kind of like early teen adolescence years as a way to kind of just uh express my own feelings and understand sort of what I was going through and it I it was legitimately fun to go learn guitar play with other people and then eventually write things and go play them in front of other people and get like a reaction out of it that was super gratifying so you were playing mostly was guitar like your main instrument yeah, so I played yeah guitar mainly. Um, eventually, like singer songwriter stuff. I learned a lot of music theory. Heavy into blues. One of my goals was so I I watched um, Back to the Future really young, and Michael J. Fox. If anyone hasn't seen it, he plays this rendition of Johnny Be Good, which is a Chuck Berry song, um, and he just rips it that scene is <laughs> so so cool and i remember seeing that and i'm like i want to do that someday i want to be able to play like that so when i got to high school i actually like studied theory for probably a couple years and just got into like songwriting i'm i i tinker you know i i, I do everything i learn by failure and learn by figuring things out so i just uh went really deep into that eventually i'm like well i want to learn to sing because i have these I, I was writing a lot of poetry and uh but i'm like i need to transform this into like lyrics that make more sense for for singing and uh so i started to learn to sing you know it wasn't like a you know naturally like crazy gifted singer out of the box and i'm a decent one to this day uh more in like the gravelly um you know acoustic version but uh but still i'm like yeah i mean i you can do it if you put your you know mind to it so um yeah that's kind of where, where that went besides uh chuck berry who else are there any other artists that you admire or look up to or you're you like that are alive or dead yeah i mean i mean i think in in high school you know 
people think it's really cool to just be obsessed with classical artists, you know, classic rock. I mean, um, so, you know, there's Hendrix and Jimmy Page and people like that. I, um, I, one of my favorite guitarists is Joe Bonamassa. He's, uh, you know, uh, American guy, um, plays kind of a mix of English uh, or British blues, American blues, probably the best, like to me, all around guitar player that's really alive. But and there are a lot of people who I think pioneered um, singer songwriter stuff to me from a technical standpoint that I appreciated, like uh, John Mayer and Dave Matthews. I actually don't really listen to much of Dave Matthews, but from a playing standpoint, he's a very good player. So, and I, I've played mostly acoustic my whole life. I, I mean, I've played electric for sure, but um, acoustic was just fascinating to me because you strip away all of the like sound sound effects and effects pedals and you know things that people get really kind of obsessed with um, when you get in the electric world. And there's a time and a place for that for sure, uh, but just to be able to pick up an acoustic guitar anywhere and then just play it, um, it is also a pretty gratifying. That's cool. One of my uh, first concerts I went to growing up was uh, at Piedmont Park here in Atlanta, which is kind of like the Central Park of Atlanta, really open. They do outdoor shows. Uh, Dave Matthews and then Allman Brothers opened for them. Uh-huh. <laughs> Allman Brothers are fantastic, too. And there's a there's a lot of, like, uh, I think very talented music and musicians that uh, came out of uh, – different you know probably like 50s to you know 2000s before a lot more computer music started entering the scene i mean the 80s i think you you know you had more synths of course but uh and it's kind of been sort of lost to some degree with i think you know probably on newer generations and i hope they get to like rediscover bands like the allman brothers and um and similar ones where you just and and even there's a guy on YouTube um, who will kind of connect the dots on popular songs now, going back to the original, you know, rhythm, uh, melody or whatever that w- that it was written. It's like a song from the fifties, nineteen fifties. So you know, there's a lot of recycled music and uh, melodies out there. So did you um do did you go to university and did you study like arts there? Um, did you ever formally study? art itself Uh, yeah i didn't formally study like you know painting i guess but so all throughout college i went to college at uh, chapman university so i went to their film school now it's a film school for producing for film and writing and a lot of the emphasis there i mean to to their credit was uh storytelling how to tell a story right what are the essential components of a story Um, how are you communicating that um of course, for on screen, how does it look when you're writing a script? During this whole time was also when my sort of music career was really hitting like higher levels. So I was, um, I got signed to management. I, and I was playing in LA. I was playing in Orange County a lot. Um, I had to f- form a band around me and... I had yeah, no idea so that, that this was a part of your life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it's it's kind of like some of it's lost on the MySpace days. Um, eventually, I went more into like just straight producing full full songs and, and you know, getting those placed in different spots. But um, I, you know, I actually, yeah. So anyways, to university point, I had this very strange crossover because I was like in the, I was in the entertainment industry in different ways. And I, I kind of had this identity crisis. Like, what am I, where am I really going with this? Am I trying to make films? Um, am I trying to be a full time touring recording musician? Um, and it, particularly cause I was on the producing side of film and I, I kind of didn't, I didn't realize this till later on, like producing a film uh, and you may see all these credits on a film. You're like, what does that even mean? Um, there, there's different kinds of producers. There's like day-to-day producers. There's like producers who oversee a film from like inception to release and maybe beyond that. That's like what a normal producer uh, role is on a film. So when you see like the top two or three names on a film, that's who that is. And then there's an executive producer 
which is usually someone from a studio and they're like representing the financial interests. And so they're saying like, uh, this, you know, this is too long. Like the ultimate sort of just black and white, is this marketable? Is this going to bring in the, you know, hundreds of millions we expect? So I was, I was around that a lot. So I cut, I, I was really cutting my teeth on, uh, trying to make it in market as a musician, but then also in the film world, navigating that and, you know, the so were you there, you were on, uh, sort of feature length films in the production side, uh, films that went out, you know, nationally and things like that, or were it. Yeah. I, so I was working on like the true back end of it in the agency system. Okay. So. Uh, if anyone's ever seen the movie or the show Entourage, like I was working in this environment, like what Jeremy Piven's character, um, Ari Gold was, um, and he's based on a, a real life, uh, talent agent, which is kind of crazy. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so I, um, uh, so I, you were, I was you were in, in LA at that, that t time working at a, uh, creative agency like that. Yeah, I was in LA and like a ta think of a talent agent as like a sports agent. Like they're representing all the best interests of these, like everyone who works on a movie, everywhere from the cinematographer to, of course, all the actors to the um, musical composers, like all these things, right? And even musicians have it to some degree. Um, they're, I mean, I, I was talking with a friend about it the other day, how even, you know, uh, w when you have a lot of alpha uh, movie stars, like, Vin Diesel and Dwayne Johnson on a movie, like they will negotiate. Okay, what do what do the fight sequences sequences look like? Who can lose? How often? How many punches yeah. do they take? Like Who, whose name comes first? You know, at the beginning. Oh, for all sure. That stuff. That's like table stakes. Yeah. <laughs> how long does it appear on the screen? I mean, it's just kind of wild all the ways they negotiate stuff. Got it. That's interesting. Yeah, I actually just uh, saw Entourage for the first time, like in the last year, and it's it's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it it definitely uh it idolizes or glamorizes that um that lifestyle, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're following around someone who's like the equivalent of Brad Pitt in the 2000s, you know. <laughs> it's and it's I think it's actually based on Mark Wahlberg's story loosely, but right, yeah. right. And um I've read uh have you ever read the book Who is Michael Ovitz? Do you know that book? Um I know the name. I I don't know I think I If know you're the book. If you're not too, you know, scarred by that time, you might like it. It's like a biography of one of the top, yeah, talent agents and how they started. I think one, I can't remember if it's UTA or CAA. It's it's one of the the really big uh, firms he started. Yeah, yeah, that's that's. I think that's C, uh, CAA, but I I could be wrong there. Yeah, they've, they've kind of like gobbled each other up now. <laughs> no worries. Um. Okay. Cool. So you're you you got into film in college, uh, doing some of that, and then um. Kind of catch me up on, I think for those who don't know your story, like, uh, when did you start taking your art more seriously? Talk about that. Yeah. So I, I mean, I got out of film and basically went into like a marketing, um, career and it was, it wasn't like in technology or it, it evolved into technology. This is like 2010, um, I took all these things I learned in the film world and, and from being a musician and, and. Um, I had done a lot of design and stuff too, by virtue of that, um, graphic design. So I, I took all this and yeah, just went into like working, you know, sort of more normal work, uh, being, being an agency world and all that kind of stuff and just found myself, uh, what sort of work were getting... you doing at the agency? So, um, combination of things, it could be anywhere from like funnel optimization, branding, um, course ideation, like we were, we were launching a lot of info products. Um, and especially when that was a huge thing, like different pricing strategies, um, just, it was really running the gamut, getting into like conversion rate optimization. So, you know, splitting a and B and C and, and all that kind of stuff for a web experience. And it was like early for people who don't know, early 2010s was when, a lot of like web tools for marketers started to really come out and 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 really enable you to do these things in a way that was like financially accessible and it also um, was was allowing you to optimize your business in a way that was never really existed before. It was only available in like 
really expensive enterprise uh, products. Um, so like, and I, I got exposure to all these different kinds of in industries, like uh, ev everywhere from breweries to medical bill auditing to um, student loans. And like, you know, you and this part of this was on the end of like, okay, con inbound marketing was becoming a thing then. So you're just, okay, how do we pump out all this content? And the Google, al Google algorithms are changing all the time. Uh, it's just, you know, it's an onslaught of information all the time. So I, I, I got really just like on the job training and all that. And I think people just for those who are listening, they're like, I need to go get a four year degree or an MBA. It's like my, my opinion, like, I don't think you do in, if you're going to go in that world because it changes so much the, one of the funniest things I see is a four year degree on digital marketing. I don't even know how you do a one year degree on digital marketing. That's, I mean, that's how fast it's changing. So that's a lot of what I learned. And I, I've, it took me a while to, to understand, I think, what, what in my, you know, background of skill sets, where were the dots connecting? Because I just seemed to kind of be flowing with the opportunities that, um, that arose or that I found that those doors opening. And I, you know, I've kind of like navigated life that way and it's, it's worked out well. Were you sometimes... in the weeds in the marketing agency, like actually, you know, monitoring the analytics and doing the web development and stuff, or were you more kind of like an account manager, you know, uh, communicating between the technical people and the clients and so kind of what, what was your day-to-day -day like? Well, so when I say agency, like that could mean a lot of things, right? That mm -hmm. could mean Accenture or it could mean five people. One guy. Which, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or one guy. Yeah. Which is, which was, I'm, I'm more like in that solopreneur or, you know, very small situation. So yeah, I, I had to get, um, very good at analysis, like number numerical analysis. Right. Um, so I've, to this day, I spend a lot of time in that, even for my own stuff. And I'll kind of share some, some of that, you know, tracking KPIs. Um, I've been doing that for as long as I can really remember. Um, but yeah, so in the weeds and then, um, not as much interfacing with clients initially. And then, and then, yeah, moving to that, it's like doing both mm -hmm. even like I was, uh, for a short time at a like really, um, intense tech stack auditing company or, you know, kind of go look at someone's, uh, uh, different technologies see how the data is messed up and then propose a solution and then like start to swap it out. Like being in the midst of that, it's just, it's a lot. So it sounds like, yeah, you, like you said, you've, you follow these opportunities and, and I'm really glad you brought up that thing about the degrees, the certification. Cause yeah, you're right. There's like a lot of people out there who feel like they need some sort of like blessing from some third party before they make a change. Like, where do you think that came from in your own life? Where was it, something you were just part of your personality that you didn't really care about that. And you just kind of would jump at opportunities. How, how, talk to me through that. Like, where did that come from? So I moved around quite a few times when I was young, um, not like military or anything. It was more like, you know, just my parents had their own reasons to move us. So I would move schools and not know anyone. I mean, I, I moved my, my last, move um was my first day of high school so i like walk into a science class third period or first day of high school no no don't know anyone so you know you, you have kind of a couple options there you can just be like totally uh stressed out and anxiety ridden about what's gonna happen or uh which is what, and the latter is what i did and i just said i'm not gonna care about any of these kind of I can't, I can't, I, I just learned to not be so consumed with other people's kind of judgments of what I was doing, which has served me well in many ways. Not to say I don't care about people. That's not the point. But uh, what holds most people back, especially artists, is um, I'm so concerned with what other people are going to think about me making this decision and me um, just 
owning my life in a way that is mine, not my parents, not my siblings, not my friends. Yeah, you have to take that accountability. And I, I think that's where like a lot of people go, I gotta go to college. Like that's I don't know, like the baby boomer freaking mentality about things. Like, I'll go get your formal education. But like, no, like do it the way that is going to work for you and your passions and drives. So no, I think you nailed it. It sounds like um, you had to basically be comfortable reinventing yourself a couple of times. I had, like as a kid, you could either just become a wallflower <laughs> or you could like make friends and you chose to make friends. And then that translates into uh, being comfortable like, oh, this opportunity presents itself to me. I've never done this before, but that didn't stop me like the four times before. <laughs> right. Well, you know, just starting something uh, new because I mean, look, there's uh, I think art is a is a great example because you can be like, well, there's a million artists out there. I mean, there's actually like way more than, you know, a billion <laughs> artists that like th there's just a lot of people out there pushing their work. Like, how how do I cut through the noise? And to some degree, I think that, you know, question people try to broach about whatever it is they're doing um, is is tr seeking to be answered long before it matters. Like you haven't really honed in on who you are. And and that's, you know, to take the school example again, like trying to say, well, what group of people do I fit into? That's like a question that's hard. To, you don't know these people. How are you going to answer that? Uh, if I just go talk to people and I know who I am, then I can be that much more true about you know, going and associating with people versus saying, well, now I have to assume this group's identity, which I get that happens um, throughout life oftentimes, but I don't, I don't think that's the best way to navigate life for a variety of reasons. So do you feel like, yeah, having those changes and moves kind of force you to reflect inward and think about who am I and like, who do I want to connect with when I'm in these new situations? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would say too, like I'm to some degree a very introspective person anyways. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I can't pinpoint why, like something from childhood or something that made me that way, but I'm, I've always been kind of like self-reflective mm -hmm. and I do think, you know, that, that is just uh, a skill set that more people could learn, do more often. Yep. Yeah. Cause it's like, it is funny how, I mean, you could go, if you went to, let's say you went to school at the same place for 13 years, you know, first day of school, you make eye contact with someone, they say hi, you say hi, like they become your friend. And it's like, you just kind of go with the, uh, you know, the least resist path of least resistance. And some people I think kind of like, yeah, just get into what's comfortable and then they just go with that as long as it'll, uh, it'll last. And whether that actually is like person's a good influence on you or, you know, what have you, but I think it's just a interesting kind of contrast to, to what you're sharing. Um, and I think the, uh, the idea about like getting certifications or degrees and certain things, it reminds me of like, um, you know, uh, I've seen in my own experience, like people will cr criticize me and they're like, oh, like he doesn't even have, you know, a degree in sales or whatever. It's like, well, <laughs> like, <laughs> like you just have to go out there and, and learn how to sell. And it's, <laughs> you know, there's certain things that like, it's just experiential learning is so much better uh, than, in the, in, than in other fields. So don't get me wrong. I think there's certain things. Yeah. Like if you want to go be a doctor, like you have to go get that, that training, but um, right in that, in that kind of classroom setting. But um, yeah, I'm with you to a degree, I think on a lot of that stuff. It's um, and, and, and because marketing is changing so much because uh, new businesses are popping up, there's new demand. It's like, if you can just show that you're self-starting and you know how to learn, like you can learn, and you can do that. You can learn how to learn better than so many more opportunities that you might have said aren't a fit for you now become available to you. Um, mm -hmm. Any any thoughts or reactions to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's going and getting an education, even your own course, right? You take your own course. It's all theory until you apply it. And I, I think understanding that, but ahead of going to consume whatever course or university program, whatever it is, is important. Because if you um, think you're just going to sort of matrix download information, 
Um, and I'm, you know, of course, referring to the movie. But if you think you're going to do that and then just all of a sudden wake up and you you have it and you can do it, that that's not the way life works. It, why, life is experientially oriented. And um, we the only <laughs> I, like the only way I think we truly learn is you you have to go apply something and see. How does it work for me? Or am I doing it right? And then like record your failures and be okay with failures. Know that that's like just part of the course of things. Um, Cause the other thing is, uh, and, and maybe some people grow up like this where it's like, there is no failure. And, or maybe you feel like emotionally traumatized because, you know, your, your parents weren't very nice to you and you didn't do something well. So you're just like, you avoid everything that has risk to it. Um, and even even those kind of people, like you're taking a risk every day driving. I mean, so uh, yeah, I, I just think okay to take risks and okay to fail is is important. Yeah, and um, I always like I get a lot of folks who come to me and they're like, uh, I want to make sure I'm doing this right, and that whole <laughs> dichotomy between like right and wrong or failing and not failing, I have to just say over and over again um, that whole binary is just not the right mental model it's more just like a spectrum of is is the action you're taking moving you closer or away from your goals or your objectives right and you just kind of if you can forget the word right <laughs> is this right um am i doing it correct uh you will uh be better served because yeah it's not like it, i feel like that that sort of um mindset is is reminiscent of yeah am i get, am i going to get like a hundred on the test or an a on the test and there's there's not really a like a a letter grade like where it's like oh if you hit this then it's done like you can do it well and then still realize that you could do it a hundred times better in the real world. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, there's so much more gradations to it than um, I think people are re realize at first. Well, one of the uh, um, one of the best sort of sayings around that I ever heard was just get one percent better every day, whatever that is. And even what you were just talking about, it's um, somewhat of like a lotto mentality. You know, I, I you know, I'm just going to keep <laughs> like you're willing to invest in uh, these lotto tickets, hoping that one day they just all pay off. They may never. Or you could just go put if, in the work. If I arrange, you know, certain pixels on my website in the right way, then like, yeah, like I'll be showered with money. And then, like, I don't have to do anything yeah. else. <laughs> yeah, and and it's I think it's the difference of like actual hard work. I mean, here's another one: the shortcut is hard work. So, like, just go do the work, and yeah, make make the progress, and and the things as you were saying, like, not make it this binary outcome, because that's uh, like in in some ways you could say, okay, my final call is somewhat of a binary outcome. Either someone, you know bought or didn't but that's also not really the case either because you you take away all these learnings every time as, as well yep yeah so um and, and i love the the one percent thing because i my math off the top of my head is not that good but if you if you do get better literally one percent every day in a year you're like 300 times better so some some weird compounding effect <laughs> <laughs> well it's the same thing like you double one penny at the beginning of a month for you know a month that that whole analogy is all also interesting because you're like uh, I, mean, I, I don't, I don't think actually, I, I do think I've heard it with grains of rice. If you're the grains of rice, that's the same thing. No, what is that? <laughs> uh, okay. It's like you have a chessboard with one grain of rice on the first square. And by the time you get to like the last square of the chessboard, you have like enough rice to feed like the whole world or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you just double but it. it uh, but yeah, like, you know, that's like the compounding interest thing, but it, there's a compounding effort thing as well. And I think people. You know, one thing I'll say, um, a lot of people read the book Outliers by uh, Malcolm Gladwell, and they get really fixated, I think, on uh, 10,000 hour rule and, you know, learn something as, as early as you can and master it and all these kind of things. And he, he, he does speak to the timing of, uh, you know, generational changes and whatnot. Uh, there's another book I really love. It's called uh, Range, um, How Generalists Succeed in a Specialized World. I I loved that book way more. And I, I did because uh, an interesting thing he points out is that um, like the hyper specialization 
is is only it, it's a minority of the like professions in the world that most people's brains in fact process and and store information um in a better way when they're cross training their brain on totally different kind of disciplines and um that even you look at some of the most successful doctors they probably have like some artistic pursuit outside of work mm -hmm. and so when they go do that painting or that music or whatever it is they're actually codifying the information that they're learning and the experiences in a way whereas the, if they just like went and did surgery or whatever and then went home and went to bed and woke up they wouldn't as as much and so the, this this notion of having like a range of interests and um exploring those um and exploiting exploiting your desire to actually get good at any one of those like that's okay um and and to some degree maybe because of college or whatever we've downplayed that um that curiosity natural curiosity that we have yeah yeah i like that and it sounds like you can so let, let me turn it on you like when you were working in marketing did you feel like that helped of all some of your artistic pursuits how did those things integrate together yeah so <laughs> I've, uh, it's, it's funny. Cause even like the music thing, he said, like, I didn't know about that. Like I, I have so many random things that I've done that, um, I just, it's just a part of me, but I, I don't, I don't go around and talk about it, but I'll, I'll go, I'll go do some other activity in, 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 in marketing, in art in whatever. And I'll just go, Oh, I I'm like, my brain's now accessing this file cabinet from this other experience and marketing is generally storytelling to a specific audience. Um, yes, there's like a broad message you could have, but um, understanding who you're talking to and, and why what you're doing or what the, the message you're trying to communicate is important to them. And that skill set that really kind of came out of film and even music, you know, you listen to a song. Um, the person who writes the lyrics, they're telling a story. Um, sometimes the music doesn't even match the story they're telling. Um, and that's kind of one of the strange things about music, but, um, I I've taken that into, um, a variety of places and especially I think in, in painting and filmmaking, of course, um, and this, uh, project I worked on, uh, for the art of grieving was huge in, in that and combining all these different skill sets and continues to be as it's evolved over the last three years, Four years. Wow. Yeah. So for the folks who are listening in who don't know about that project, The Art of Grieving, can you just share a little bit about that and um, and how that came about? Yeah. So the short of it is The Art of Grieving is, um, it's a film. So it's a documentary that's available on uh, Amazon Prime and Apple TV and, and some other places. And it really started in uh, 2019, uh, February 2019. I lost my brother uh, unexpectedly. And so the year prior to that, um, this kind of answers one of your questions, uh, Harry, but I had, I had kind of gotten back into painting. I did abstract before to some degree, but the, so 2018, I got back into painting 2019, uh, my brother passes away. And so I really, I turned to the canvas, of course, I'm like, well, I, I need to like process this. Fortunately, I have these different, um, things I've done, uh, artistically to, to help express that. And. Um, later that year in about September, I decide to paint every day for a year and document this whole process um, to, to make a documentary eventually. And the goal there being, um, and, and definitely like watch the film to um, get more context in it, but um, one of the gist there being that in my own experience, uh, grief is just, it's such an awkward, seldomly talked about subject, especially with men. Um, and so I, I just really got tired of that notion and feeling like things were kind of trapped inside. So I look to my background and I go, I have this very strange arsenal of skill sets through filmmaking and marketing and networking, even the, just the ability to kind of pull people on this project, um, that I can assemble something to put it together and the thing that most people um 
And you may be thinking to yourself, well, do you have funding or how did this come about? I literally one day, this was August 2019, uh, I had taken this break from my job at the time to kind of like reconfigure what am I going to do? Went, got away from the normal family situation, got some thinking time. I wrote in a journal, paint every day for a year, make a documentary about it. Like that was it. And it started with something as simple as that. And just four years later, still uh, doing, you know, working through that project. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the, uh, that's the short of it. Um, and it was released last summer. Um, so summer 2022 and I've been going through a post-release PR cycle, all this kind of stuff related to that. Um, yeah. So when this happened to you, did you have like adults with your parents or mentors or, um, like, did you have a language around grief and emotions to like be able to process this or like, was it something that you had to kind of get comfortable with as a man as well in that moment uh, for the first time? Well, I, you know, I think grief is, is weird in that um, you feel a lot of emotions at once. And there's another time in life where for sure everybody goes through this is like um, early teen years. I mean, there's a reason why teenage years are so hard. There's a bit of grief over loss of childhood. Like you have, greater expectations on you. And so that's, and, and also you're going through puberty. So you're just like, it's, it's, a cocktail. it's intense. <laughs> yeah. Right. For the first time, grief is kind of like that in a way, except, um, if you're an adult and you're going through it, through it, uh, grief from loss of somebody. Um, yeah, you're, you're like, I, you don't experience those things on a normal basis. In fact, if anything, the world's kind of numbed you to that. So, uh, you have to get good at like, uh, identifying like, what you're feeling, but also to like, go feel it, you know, like I, I had to learn to cry. Um, I actually cried a lot as a kid, you know, it was like an older brother where I was getting in fights and stuff and just emotional. Most kids are emotional. You get to a point and you're like, well, no more tears. All right. I guess I don't <laughs> cry anymore. You know, <laughs> I, I turn that valve off. And, uh, yeah. So, I mean, just learning how therapeutic, uh, or healthy that is for you. Um, but that was part of why I wanted to paint is because I, I felt like I uh, understood myself a bit more through painting and reflecting on that, especially when uh, grief is the something, uh, an experience oftentimes where you're not sure how to describe it. And that's part of the challenge of it. Um, and especially like I, I read a lot. I would consider myself like pretty articulate and, and have a good, uh, you know, arrangement of, uh, or good diction. Right. Um, but, uh, it's still, it's difficult. A hundred percent. Yeah. Um, I can't, I can't imagine. Um, were you like, uh, reading books on grief or therapy at the time, or, um, was it just something that, you know, the, the canvas alone and, and working with the art was something to help you kind of work through some of this, this period of time? I found talking to people helpful. So I'm very much like this talk it out person. I'm that yeah. person in the relationship that's like, you have a problem. Let's talk about it. <laughs> so um, that's 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 how I work with myself. Like, uh, okay, well, I, I got to talk about it. Um, I I didn't really get actually into like books about grief. I mm -hmm. actually, in in some ways, I wanted to just figure it out without have it. Yeah, without having to for someone tell me, hey, this is this is this is the way you grieve. Even people um the, so the Kubler Ross, like five stages of grief, whatever, that's so taken out of context. It was like initially made for people who are uh I think terminally ill. Mm -hmm. And it's like it, it there aren't five stages of grief. Um but anyways, that's used often. So that's one of those things, right? If I just looked up grief, I would find that in Google, probably say, here are the five stages. And I would go, okay, well, I need to go go through the five stages. Um, this is partially why I'm like, I need to do something that's for me and my own process. Because um, mind you too, like I have a wife and three kids and they're all seeing me go through this. Like I really can't be the best person I can. 
uh, unless I'm, I'm really being intentional about this. Um, so, um, and there's certainly a spiritual component to this too, where I, there is prayer and they're seeking wise counsel and there's, um, you know, trying to be healed spiritually as well. So I, you know, I have people in my life who I, I sought for that as well. And, and reading scripture, but it, the, the pain is the pain. So, um, there is a certain amount of, uh, just naturally delving into your own process. You got to do. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I think, um, uh, as a man as well, like I can't speak to like the female experience, but I, I would imagine, yeah, like there's a, I feel like men have a tendency of, yeah, kind of being maybe overly cerebral or like getting in your own head. So I think it was kind of very wise of you to figure out that like, no, like you need to figure this out and just kind of like live through it and process it in a more like physical way than trying to just, um, like fall into some other person's mental model and like walk through their steps, you know, intellectually or something like that. Um, so that's, that's really interesting. So tell me about the actual like filming process. Like, were you just, what, what sort of raw footage were you getting daily when you were doing this project? Yeah. So I, you know, I, I guess to be clear for people listening, the documentary isn't just like me painting nonstop for, <laughs> you know, a long time. It's like you're back and then there's just the canvas uh, every day. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, I have like 40 something hours of just me painting. So nobody wants to watch that. But, um, th that was actually one of the challenges, right? So I told you, I wrote, wrote in this journal, make a documentary about it. I did not know what that was. Um, and this is prior to the whole world kind of like shutting down. So it's 2019. Um, I moved to, I moved states from Washington to Texas. So um, it, by the time I was done with the, all the paintings in 2020 and I was ready to uh, hang this thing, it was like, man, like, yeah, what is the documentary? I had to ask myself that. And I first actually, so prior to the filming, I um, actually I hired a story producer uh, and someone who I'd worked with uh, prior and knew from um, Washington, Portland, Oregon area. And we went through, and she was very talented. Like, ex I wanted someone objective to kind of extract this out of me and then say, here is the story, right? And, or, you know, what do you, what do you think of this? So we collaborated on that. And then that's what dictated, you know, really truly what the documentary uh, became. And I think that's, um, that's something maybe in filmmaking people might miss. Like, before a script is written, you're usually doing some kind of outline of what are we, what what are the core components of the story, what's it going to like tell, and um, that's part of the, even what your course um, kind of takes you through, you know, right? Is like what are right. what what are the core components of anyone's story, and how are you how are you going to communicate that? Um, so yeah, I mean, a, a lot of the footage circles around this uh, intense process of having to assemble all these 365 paintings into a 10 foot by 20 foot mosaic. And there's 4,500 backlights behind it. So, you know, what does that look like? And then we bring in an art therapist. Um, so again, uh, how, <laughs> how and what it would look like was so, uh, you know, something we had to figure out along the way to some degree. And, yeah. And, so yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like, yeah, you kind of started filming and recording and documenting things, but you didn't necessarily have uh, like a classical like arc or some sort of, you know, direction or maybe like a, a story mapped out at the beginning when you were doing that. Is that fair? Yeah, that that's fair. So no, definitely not at the beginning. And most documentaries are like that to some degree. And Documentaries are weird because they can come in so many shapes or forms. Like um, the uh, guy, what's the the Lion King? Or not the Lion King. The dude from the South. Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Tiger Joe King. Exotic. Tiger King. Yeah, Tiger King. Okay, good. So, I yeah, not Lion King, but uh, Tiger <laughs> King. So, um, I know one of the backgrounds of that story was interesting is that, you know, he, of course, hired... Uh, all these people that got like just follow him around. He's a bit of a narcissist, I guess, and it's just like my daily life, just follow me around and all my shenanigans. They, the guy who owned all that after everything took place, he took all that to, um, I think a producer or something, and was like, hey, let's make something out of this, right? 
And of course you get supplemental stuff like, and documentaries can come about so many different ways. And it's part of the fun thing of documentaries. You, and you're also not having to follow a strict um, narrative structure such that if, if you were creating a Pixar movie um, and they're fantastic at storytelling for the most part, but you are going to have a formula for this. Um, documentaries are allowed to break that a little more. So yes, quite a bit of, learning and figuring out along the way and also doing um we did uh like test screenings with family and friends and um with also the production crew and making edits where it's like that wasn't a good part we need to fix it and getting that feedback and going back and tweaking it trying not to take it personal yeah. <laughs> how long did it take to do the editing and get the final cut um the editing took a while so this was like uh, most of the people worked on the film like just they they believed the message of it so they really volunteered their time um the uh the two main editors i had that like they assembled a lot of the interview footage um the b-roll that we had and that took months i don't know five six months and eventually I took a sabbatical from work, um, partially just due to like total burnout and needing a change in life. But <laughs> I took a sabbatical from work to change it because I, I realized that I this is never going to get done unless I do something that extreme. So for probably about a month straight, uh, I worked like, you know, the equivalent of full time hours, probably more and just thinking about this nonstop and 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 edited it and then i took a break from it um went back and did sound design and and you know um got the music for it so yeah probably wow. like two months overall wow wow so um it's been out for a while now like what's tell tell me a bit about like what's the impact been how has it reached people and helped people yeah um so it's been <clears throat> it's been seen in over 30 countries i would so the uh, the way I make money from this film is basically through like ads, ad supported platforms, or if you go buy it on Amazon. But um, I've kind of reverse engineered how they pay out, and I would estimate it's probably like thirty five, forty thousand people have seen the film, um, and uh, it's on a ton of platforms. But the the thing that has been uh, actually quite interesting on it are the different types of people who view it and what their intrigue is right so there's just generally someone who's who has lost someone and they they want it's a therapeutic device for them and afterwards it inspires them to go paint which is so cool when i hear people watch it and go paint uh and and it's like they may have painted before may have never painted whatever the case that's uh amazing uh someone who's saying i lost so and so X years ago, I, I I have not, I just realized I haven't actually resolved this. Like I have not, I just shelved my grief somewhere. And so there's those kinds of people. And then there's like, I had someone from the UK who just was floored on it. Uh, he works with um, a lot of uh, kids who've like lost their parents. And uh, so he is part of like a public program in the UK. And he's like, I've, I haven't seen, you know, kind of a grief journey depicted this way. So it's just, it's seems like it's getting people to um, discuss the kind of um, what the film was about and reflect either on their own grief or go bring it to someone and say, hey, I think this would be helpful for you, which is super validating of the hypothesis of the film. Um, and the other thing I'll say there is, uh, you know, when the way distribution works, you go see a film, and you're like, hey, who's actually putting this out there? Um, this was a, a like, indie film to the max self-funded um i we had someone who promised of course to get us into all these places um, did you try to get into any festivals money. or shows or anything like that yeah actually yeah sorry so we were at a oh, guy like 15 plus film festivals we won awards at like six of them so um that's super cool and then so that all of this provided some fodder to eventually go and do a PR pitch. Um, I had like tons of entertainment press people say, Oh, the film's already out. Nobody cares. 
And I'm like, that's BS. I don't even, I, I mean, I, I get the timeliness of it, but this isn't like a typical Hollywood release. It has a broad appeal. Um, this isn't just an action movie. This is, this is actually something that could help. So uh, I, I found a guy on Upwork who is fantastic, helped me create pitches for this. And we used some of the quotes, quotes we had um, from like uh, other people. We used the film festivals. We used the fact that it was already out on Amazon and these other places and it had been seen in these countries. And um, we, we did a PR pitch and got tons of placements. I mean, I was on like four or five, like, um, you know, large, like uh, Fox, that kind of stuff, um, local news stations, um, an NPR station, um, tons of other articles. And people saw those and started to go see it more as well. So it's just been really cool to, to have that uh, effect go on and, and also like have done advertising as well on it. That's awesome. I love that. And I, I think um, it's got to be really cool to uh, like just see the, the, the journey come full circle where it, this process helped you. You document it, you share, and now it's can help people for a very long time. You know, like it can have a ton of impact and it, it will live on in a, in a lot of different ways. So um really happy for you. Um thanks. What uh do you have any future plans for the project? Like kind of are, is it something you're still working on and pushing forward in different ways? Yeah. So um of course, like uh in between the 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 film and some of what it's going on right now is the film and what you the process you see there is kind of when I came across you and um started to turn what I did for myself into a service for other people. So that's that's where my sort of my grief commissions came into play. Um and those have been uh, a fantastic experience. Um but my real next step and i i just had a, a push on this no i ha haven't had the outcome i wanted yet is to get the um basically have a live event for this so uh, a place where you can watch the documentary see the full mosaic in person and then watch a light show and be able to have a qa with me and i was talking to one uh pretty big experiential art exhibit uh that has different locations. One of them's in Scottsdale. They ultimately decided to pass on it, but I've had certain people come across um, who are interested in doing that. It's a lot of work. Um, I mean, this is something I would like to turn into, uh, like a you know, an event that runs for say six weeks or something like that, and people can buy tickets too. But the goal is to actually hold that event, film parts of it, and then add a resolution to the documentary. That basically mm -hmm. says three, four, five, whatever, however many, however many years later it is after it ends today, and show the progress since it initially released because that was actually part of the original vision for the film. It was just wasn't possible at right. the time, and and in in some ways it's been kind of really a blessing to have this version that I have now that has been able to touch people's lives. And that's the thing that will probably pull people really in into a uh, a more like sort of grandiose setting that um, can can really tie it all together in that live experience I really or initially envisioned. Can I share a thought or a suggestion on that? Sure. Um, I think that's cool. I think that would be awesome. And and maybe if that you know uh, ex uh, uh, experiential art exhibit goes well maybe it's something you could do like a road show or maybe you could like take it to different cities because i feel like you're gonna impact a lot of people in scottsdale or wherever you do it but it could be something that travels well have you thought about that yeah and I, that's been brought up that i'm like it may I've not thought make about sense. all these ways to huh? <laughs> it may not make sense for your your you know with your family and all that stuff you've got to probably other things but well i you know it's it's something that it it's feasible and there's like a demand for it, I'd figure it out. That that the challenge is actually mainly like the the size of the mosaic, how that kind of goes around. And I've I've kind of uh tinkered with all these ways in my mind of how you would break it into panels for Smaller traveling. Smaller pieces, because, right. Yeah, because this other um this other art exhibit or art gallery, they uh they were kind of struggling with that as well. And so I had to 
you know, something that I could put more mental energy. I don't think maybe they, if you crack that, really yeah. That. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. But that, that's a good suggestion. Yeah. I mean, I hope, hopefully that'd be the case. I think uh, that, yeah, the first yeah. logical move is to do it once in one city, but, um, it just seems like a way that you could, yeah, I don't know, take it to New York and LA and, and DC and, and just impact a lot of people in those environments. And then you could get more footage, you know, of people and, and the effect it's had on them and, and, um, I mean, you could, you could create, uh, yeah, like a, a follow on documentary about people that maybe started doing art <laughs> from seeing your thing and seeing how the effect it had on their lives and stuff like that. <laughs> well, and it's funny because the original story producer I met with, she's like, I don't think this is a, um, well, <laughs> she's like, I think this is a series. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, hold the phone here. Like I, I don't have just tens of millions of dollars lying around to make a series. Um, I'm like, let's do this one documentary. And then, it, you know, it was actually, it was going to be this, like me searching into other people's lives and how, um, they've sort of like assumed totally different roles or identities in life. That was actually a reflection of the person who passed away and to see their kind of unique journey there. Uh, there's still room for that. Um, I mean that I hope that gets made, uh, someday, but, um, it, it, it is, if the, again, right. If this thing can open up those doors to, um, like really get more people talking then great. Yeah. One step at a time. So yeah. for, um, folks who are listening who maybe are, um, have lost a loved one or they're struggling with grief of some sort, do you have any sort of like words of advice or a wisdom you could just share with them? Yes. Um, you know, one thing I've noticed is that I, I think people feel uh, guilty if they aren't sad. And that sadness is like honoring the person you lost. And I, you know, I want to be here to encourage you that, like, and one way to look at the loss of this person is to go, like, Go live a life that is like fulfilling and that's going to be, you know, above and beyond what you thought life could be and do it. No, do that in the way that's going to honor the person. Don't feel like you have to be, you're never going to forget about them and don't, and don't feel like you have to stay in kind of a sort of more sad and uh, depressive zone. Like just go, go work on yourself and, and like be okay doing that. Take the time to do it. Um, for yourself and for the people around you. I think that's that's really important. I think that's a great sentiment. Um, thanks for sharing that. That's I think that's going to be really helpful to a lot of people. So um, if um, people want to le learn more about you, Preston, where can they find more about you online? Yeah, uh, on Instagram, just at Preston Zeller. And, and I know you'll have that in the show notes too. Um, my uh, art website is zellerhouseart.com. And then the film... Um, the art of grieving film.com. You can of course find that on Amazon prime, Apple TV, and, um, it's actually going to be on YouTube's, um, official like movie streaming center, um, pretty soon. So that'll be cool. Or Google it. I don't know. They just <laughs> tell you all the places to watch it. So yeah. Awesome. Well, Preston, thanks so much for sharing your story. Really, um, informative. I learned a lot and, um, yeah, I hope to talk to you soon. Cool. Thanks, Harry. All right. Bye everybody. Thanks for tuning in today. If you haven't picked up a copy of the Unstarving Artist book, go ahead and pick up yours at unstarvingartistbook.com. See you next time.